Good evening, everybody. All righty. Looking like a small group tonight, huh? Yeah. Alan, what's that? <laughs> what's that avatar you're using tonight? Agiar, the Wrath of God. No, the avatar that you just had on the screen. Yeah. So from Agiar. Agar, I don't really know how to pronounce it. Agar, the wrath of God. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was binging all the, like last week I had Nosferatu, binging all the Warner Herzog films. Oh, terrific. It's probably now one of my favorite directors, I would say. Yeah? Yeah, really. Like his ethereal style. From a documentary standpoint or a narrative standpoint? A uh, narrative. Yeah, I know I did the uh, Grizzly Man or Grizzly Bear Man documentary. Huh. That was good. But no, I really like his narrative, narrative films. He's done a, quite a few documentaries over the years. Um, I was kind of surprised to see him starting to do direct narrative only because he'd been a documentarian for so long. And he's acting now, too. He's apparently in the... Uh, the Mandalorian, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which i think is really great i think he's a, actually an excellent character actor yeah i actually like him too and the crew's getting a lot of money out of that one yeah <laughs> the mandalorian is uh got some interesting cutting edge tech going on and a lot of interesting uh, stuff going on behind the scenes yeah too. like you're talking about the warp screen thing yeah that's cool i really actually call, it, that. They call it the uh they get the volume they call it the volume yeah, I actually want to work with it. <laughs> um, Mr. Walsh? Yes? I'm going to probably head out around 7.30 because it's a rocket launch tonight around some time. Rocket launch, eh? Yeah. SpaceX? SpaceX, yes. What is it this time? More of those? Um, they're launching uh, the Star something. Starlink, more of those little oh, satellites. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, I just want, I've, it's been a while since I've seen a rocket, like, rocket, so. So we can all get cancer of the ears. <laughs> From our five actually, we're five. actually, we're pretty fine. Like, there's, um, <laughs> like, there's a certain number of feet we have to, be like, 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 if we're directly on the bottom of it. SpaceX said that they're launching that space. Says it's, it's just delayed in the chat. Yeah, someone just said it got delayed. Ah, so now you have to stay, Andrew. <laughs> All right. We have a small group, which is fine. Um, let me toss this out to you. Yesterday, I recorded the whole review session with my section one class. And so that video is up. So we could either go through the whole review like I did with them, or we could treat this as an open question session for you guys. And then I will put a link to their review session in your lecture web courses page if you have specific concerns you want to address this evening. So I will put that out there and you guys can let me know how you want to go about this. How would you rather do it? You want to just do a straight up review session or do you have yeah. specific things you want to cover? I want to do a review, review session, review please. Sounds yeah, review good. session. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, then. Should we get started? And I guess I'll just admit people as they sort of straggle in here. <clears throat> Let's go with... 
Okay. So here we are, week eight. Uh, your um, test will open. Oh, let me <laughs> share my screen to make this better for your experience. There we go. How's that? Okay. So your test will open this evening after class is over. And what I'll do is um, I'll uh, transfer all this to uh, to web courses and put it up there for you. Um, and then the test will open. It will be accessible to you. You don't have to start taking it right away. Um, but I'll get this video up and I'll get that all sorted out for you. And then it'll open, I think, around 9 p.m. So you could take it as early as 9 p.m. Unless you want to do something like watch this video over again or do some more studying on your own of something you have, some materials you have. And then you have 90 minutes to take it at any point for the remainder of the week. And since you guys start on Tuesday, I think I put your test open until Saturday night. Let me just verify that. <clears throat> yeah, March 6th is Saturday night. So you'll have, so your, your quiz offsets from the folks that have class on Mondays. Okay. So having said that, let's forge ahead. So this is a comprehensive look at how we've spent the semester from weeks one through seven. Um, important remaining course dates in the event that there's somebody uh, in this class um, who's not doing well and you feel like you're better served withdrawing from the class, you have until March 26th to do so. Um, but as I've been grading your work and, and looking at the grade book and so forth, I don't think there's anybody that really would fall into that category. So, but if I've overlooked somebody and you feel like that's your best course of action, you have uh, a little bit of time left, but you have to make your decision by the 26th. Our last class day, uh, it's Monday the 26th for my section one. I think we have uh, Tuesday the 27th is our last day, our last class day, uh, which will be a review day. Um, ba -bum -bum -bum, and then you will have your uh, final exam uh, sometime after that. Now, I expressed uh, to the class on Monday, yesterday, that rather than have the last two days of the semester are Monday, May 3rd, and Tuesday, May 4th. Now, normally your final test would be on Tuesday, which would be May 4th, but that's like the absolute last day of the semester. So what I'm thinking is it might be wiser if I can do this to open your final test sooner um, and just have it, you know, accessible uh, just like your midterm timed, timed quiz, you know, when you open it, you got like an hour, hour and a half, whatever. Um, but I'll open it sooner, like maybe Friday night or Saturday, Saturday or something. So that in, in case there's some kind of wacky uh, internet problem or web courses does something really wonky, um, we won't be backing up against the administrative final day of the semester. Okay, so I'm going to make sure that I can do that, that it's cool with uh, with admin and then I'll let you guys know, okay? But so for right now, I have you down as Tuesday, May 4th for your final, but I'm gonna call that, let's think about that as the absolute last day you could take the, the test, okay? Um, you still have spring break coming up too, starting on uh, Sunday the 11th through Saturday the 17th. So <laughs> just in the nick of time before the semester's over, you're gonna get a week off. Um, there's no remaining holidays and you're going to take the midterm at some point the rest of this week. So that's the schedule. Um, any questions? Okay, moving on. Has anybody experienced any difficulty uh, using the portal or dealing with the, um, the operations uh, office, the film equipment room, uh, renting cameras or anything of that nature? It's me. I've already mentioned that several times. Uh, you you had trouble and mentioned it to me already. I don't remember. It wouldn't show me the instructions on the assignment. Page. Oh right 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 yeah that's right that's right we dealt with that though and you're good now right yeah okay good yeah um, but beyond that anybody else have any issues uh, accessing that office or borrowing equipment if you needed to? No all good. Uh-oh, Marcus, you're shaking your head. What does that mean? 
I was shaking my head to say that I didn't have any problems oh, okay. with it. Okay, good, 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 excellent. All right then, uh, good, we can move on. In the beginning of the semester, I gave you guys a bookshelf, uh, PDFs of all of these texts. Some of them you haven't had reading assignments in yet because we haven't covered the topics in those, in those textbooks. Um, but as far as uh, this quiz that we have this week, I think the only two manuals that really um, will be affected are the first two, the, the uh, primary textbook, the intro to cinematography and the assistance manual. Um, I don't know, I don't think I've given you a reading assignment out of cinematography yet. I will though for next week. Um, this one uh, I just gave you guys, but you should have it already from your uh, film 2424 class. Um, and the rest of these are um, stuff for the latter portion of the semester. I will be giving you a reading assignment though out of the Blue Brown book um, on exposure. So, and I'll put that in your reading assignment. Maybe I'll do it under week eight reading assignment so you can get a jump on it. It'll be the chapter on exposure. And I think it's, it's in the latter portion of the book. It is uh, page, where was it? Page looking, page searching, page searching. Uh-oh, I've lost it. Where did I, I dog eared it and then, there it is. Page 171. Um, it's about 20, 25 pages. So we'll give you a little time to get a jump on that, okay? Um, so that's coming up. Um, okay, so let's start going through the outline. Week one was the intro. That's kind of, you know, we just talk about the syllabus and stuff. Not much to talk about there. Um, except that I wanted to plant a couple of seeds with you early. Uh, one was the tradition of the uh, motion picture industry. And, you know, part and parcel of the camera department. Um, and then in the notion that I wanted you to think about and to warm up to was the idea that you guys are the next generation of filmmakers, film innovators, film enthusiasts, film hobbyists, film professionals, whatever role you're gonna seek moving forward. As, lo as long as you understand, and I want to stress this, this point to you that you are standing on the shoulders of several many generations of innovation, and exploration, trial and error, and passion. Uh, we are now, as a film industry, in something like our 140th year, something like that. So the craft of motion picture filmmaking uh, is now well over a century old, okay? What is unique about this time period, though, is you, you guys are existing in the midst of a paradigm shift, a great paradigm shift. Um, there's been a few over the course of the history of the industry. Um, the very first one, I mean, aside from the invention of the motion picture camera itself, I think the, the next major uh, innovation that really um, affected the industry and how we, how we view filmmaking was the invention of, believe it or not, the invention of the fluid head. Um, the invention of the tripod head itself, allowing us to pan the camera in the process of capturing an image. Up to that point, everything was like a postcard. Put the tripod down, point the camera at your, your subject and grind off a few feet, you know, a few minutes, a few seconds, whatever. Uh, capture that moment in kind of a, a marquee shot. Um, but the minute we got the is that why they use head, multiple? Pardon? Is that why they use multiple cameras, like in this picture, because they couldn't really pan, and if they wanted a different shot, they would go to the well. This picture, camera? this picture is not quite that old. Um, they do have heads yeah. on the cameras, um, but yeah, what they used to do is mount the cameras, and I think I gave you a reading assignment that covered that um, about how you know the initial. Um, camera placements were lockdowns, lock-off shots. So you had a, a, a set of legs, you had a tripod for 
uh, support of the camera, but there was no way for the camera to pan while you were shooting. So you had to sort of point at whatever you wanted to shoot at, roll off some footage, and then move to your next shot. Um, a lot of times what they would do is they would take um, cameras and they would mount them on uh, trains. And so they would get these great uh, panoramic shots or what they called ghost rides, right, where the camera would just sort of travel through the landscape and you would see whatever was passing in front of the lens. But again, the camera itself couldn't change its point of view. Right. It locked in dolly. Okay, phantom rides, I think we call them. They call them. Okay. And now so we have that, dolly. Wow. That dolly came much yeah. later. Dolly came much yeah. later. So we got the tripod head around, I think, 1890 something, 18, maybe 97. Um, and then uh, after that, um, we, we got audio, right? And with when, when audio came on board, uh, we also finally locked in our frame rate up until about 1920 something, I guess, when we adopted audio uh, soundtracking with visuals. Um, we had, the, the industry had no standard frame rate. So the frame rate, people were shooting at frame rates as low as 12 frames per second and as fast as 30 or 40 frames per second. Uh, and it was kind of random. Some of the cameras were manual crank. So there was really no way of knowing exactly how many frames a second you were shooting. But the minute sound was married with images and projected on the screen, there was gonna be one magical frame rate that was gonna match the audio. So if you saw a shot of somebody talking and their lips are moving in the images and you hear the words in the audio, there was gonna be one particular frame rate that was going to be as close as possible to getting what we call the lip flap correct. And that turned out to be 24 frames a second. So that was the next paradigm in the industry, you know, after the tripod and the tripod head was uh, sound and the standardization of a frame rate. Um, then in the, in the 30, in the early 30s, I guess we got the first camera crane uh, which allowed us to get some interesting camera angles beyond the basic tripod shot. Um, soon after that, of course, there was going to be innovations uh, uh, in the area of the dolly that you mentioned. Um, then we had a war. Um, and then the folks came back from the war and we went back into the studios and started making movies again. And the next innovation was um, color. Uh, technology, color images, and shortly thereafter, widescreen color images, okay, because we were competing now as an industry against an emerging technology called television, which was keeping people at home uh, and preventing them from wanting to even go out and go to the theaters anymore when they could watch and get entertainment content at, at home in the comfort of their own house. So color and widescreen presentation was the next innovation that really changed the industry radically. Um, then we had a few years of, of quiet. We got 16 millimeter. We got the uh, French new wave migrated to America and we got the American uh, new wave, uh, 16 millimeter independent feature films. Um, and that sort of lent itself to a slow transition from a studio industry to an independent industry, um, which was in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, and then cameras sort of innovated slowly over the years and didn't do a whole lot. Um, we had a paradigm shift in television from standard definition to high definition, uh, which increased the resolution, the color sampling, um, and the aspect ratio of our presentations at home. We went from a four to three uh, aspect ratio with a TV safe uh, 1.37 uh, ratio to 16 by nine, uh, which was a longer, uh, more rectangular presentation screen. So we had that kind of happen. Um, and then uh, now we uh, let takes us to the moment that we're at now where digital technology is now supplanting photochemical technology as the main source of acquisition for our motion picture images. And you guys are sitting right on the crest of that wave. You're riding it right into the new, the new age of filmmaking. Um, this paradigm is only maybe a little over 10 years old at this point. 
um, the official adoption of digital technology by the industry movers and shapers was in 2011, when the ASC, the American Society of Cinematographers, finally gave their blessing to digital acquisition and said that the quality was as good as film acquisition and that it was a viable uh, capture medium for studio film production and television. Okay, so that was kind of a radical breakthrough um, that happened not that long ago, so just 10 years ago. Um, so like anything else, there's always a transition period from the old to the new where the, the old guard hands the baton to the new guard. Some of us transition over, some of us retire. Um, and you'll ride this next wave for the next however many years until there's yet another uh, uh, innovation that will shake the industry up and, and be a disruptor. Um, right now, digital is still uh, in the evolution stages. It gets better every year, um, but that's kind of where we're at. So you guys are, uh, you're occupying an interesting time in film, in film history. Um, remember, remember this time and period and, and, and what you're going through because you'll look back on it fondly one of these days, I'm sure. Uh, outside of the notion of the tradition of the industry, I also wanted to plant a seed uh, with you guys, which was that the industry is now more than ever um, a, an art form and an industry that is more diverse than it has ever been. So we have more different groups of folks involved in filmmaking than we really have ever had before. Um, and so I pointed toward my friend, Nancy Schreiber as to, to illustrate uh, uh, the point, which was that um, for the longest time, the film industry was considered a male dominant medium. It was a, it was a patriarchal hierarchy and women were relegated to roles like hair and makeup and wardrobe and maybe the art department. Um, and that men fulfilled most of the other roles that were available uh, in the industry. But now, thanks to uh, innovation, thanks to new blood entering the industry every year, thanks to evolution and improvement in social values and in social norms, we have uh, opportunities emerging for everyone and uh, my friend Nancy is a prime example of that. She started uh, at the bottom rung in New York as a, as a technician, as a PA, worked her way up through the lighting department, moved to California, uh, started the process again at the bottom in the camera department as a loader, worked her way up to cinematographer. She's a working cinematographer uh, to this day. She hasn't quite retired yet. Uh, in fact, in this image, you can even see her embracing digital technology. So she's got a 5D, probably a Mark II at this time of the picture, uh, with a cinema lens adapted for it. So uh, she's been an early adopter of the digital technology, uh, and she continues to learn her craft, practice her craft, and uh, she's, a, uh, she's an influencer. Uh, she's in the uh, American Society of Cinematographers, and she's one of those female uh, DPs at this point who are laying the groundwork for all you future DPs out there, uh, all of you young ladies who might have aspirations to lead the department yourselves. Okay, you can look towards folks like Nancy, um, Amy Vincent, Ellen Curris. Um, there's a number of uh, there's a number of really terrific DPs out there that are that are women in the industry working right now. Reed Moreno. I mean, Reed Moreno, uh, she was a cinematographer and now she's even directing. She's responsible for the look in a lot of the episodes of The, uh, uh, the Handmaid's Tale. So we have a number of folks out there that are making strides, you know, and it's, uh, it's really, so not only from a technological standpoint, from, but from a social diversity standpoint, the industry is right now, I think, as, as vibrant as it has ever been. The last thing I, the last thought I left you with in week one was um, the, to think about the role of the cinematographer. What, what's the job of the director of photography uh, in the context of a, a feature film or in the production of a television show? And that kind of carried us to week two where we followed up the conversation with what is cinematography and who is the cinematographer? Who is this person? What are they doing? What's their job like? Who, uh, who are the leaders in the industry? What is their 
style comprised of, and I gave you some examples. So we talked about yard care. Talked about um, these four uh, examples: Roger Deakins, uh, Emmanuel Lebetsky, Chris Doyle, and Seamus McGarvey. And we looked at their uh, websites if they had them. We looked at their production reels uh, and talked a little bit about their their um, contributions to the industry. And then I had you do an assignment. And the assignment was for you to do a little research into uh, a cinematographer of your choice. And I gave you a list of the active members of the uh, American Society of Cinematographers. And then some of you opted to go off the list, off menu, and you had somebody already in mind. And, and so you did a report uh, on those individuals and told me a little bit about their style, a little bit about the tools they like to use, a little bit about their personal histories, their work histories. <clears throat> and hopefully that started to open up your awareness of some of the folks that are involved in filmmaking that I think don't get nearly enough critical mention. Um, I know that, uh, you know, in BTS videos and stuff on your DVDs and, and Blu-rays, you know, they'll tell you they've got a behind the scenes uh, documentary about the making of whatever the movie is. And then it'll be a discussion about the producers, the director and the actors. Uh, and there really won't be much mention at all of the people, the, the entire rest of the crew, quite frankly, um, who are all contributing at their level towards the success of that film that you, or that TV show. And so I think most of those creative people go nameless, some of them for their entire careers. And, you know, so we end up with a very narrow uh, scope or list of people that might be a household name. Like it's probably not unusual for people to have heard of Roger Deakins or heard the name before, uh, or maybe have heard the name El, uh, El Chivo before or Emmanuel Lebetsky before because those, those names have entered into the public sphere, into the, into the vernacular of our time. Uh, but there's so many folks, so many hundreds and thousands of contributors and collaborators uh, that have come and gone over the years that never get mentioned. They have their careers, um, uh, you know, some long, some short, some fruitful, some not so fruitful. Um, and that's really, at the crux of this, you know, this initial assignment, which is to get you uh, to start thinking about all those other people that are collaborating on a film. You, you know, already we're at the midterm in this, in this course, for instance, and you may have already come to the conclusion that you don't want to be in the camera department at all when you graduate from college, or you never thought of it before, and now you do want to be part of the camera experience when you graduate and, and you get out into the world. And that's the whole point of this thing is, is let's help you figure out uh, what it is that you want to do and where you're going to fit into this whole amazing tapestry. Okay. We talked about the positions on a film. We talked about the director of photography and what that role in, uh, entails. Um, we talked about uh, Roger Deakins from Skyfall um, and the fact that he likes to operate his own cameras, but that traditionally speaking, we have a director of photography in charge of the entire department. And very often that director of photography will also have a camera operator in addition to assistants who does nothing more than lens each shot and commit each shot to media, whatever that media is, film, digital, whatever. Um, so that person is the person with their eye to the eyepiece. And the DP may or may not be that same individual. The DP may sit in a chair next to the director throughout the entire production um, and simply watch the monitor. Um, but one of the interesting things about proactive DPs like Roger Deakins is in the beginning of their career when they were shooting documentaries or doing small independent films or commercials and things of that nature, um, they got used to operating their own cameras and they liked it um, and became it became a visceral part of the creative experience for them to watch the scene as it unfolds through the eyepiece of the camera and look at the entire world they they have fashioned through the optics of the camera um, as a way of understanding how all those integrated pieces fit together 
and make adjustments and make corrections and make improvements based on that point of view through the lens. I happen to agree, unfortunately, in the electronic era, most of the cameras are offering you an electronic image. If you get a viewfinder at all, it's, it's, basically, a, it's basically an electronic image, no different than one that would be on a monitor 20 feet away next to the director and, and the director's chairs. Um, but there's something about putting your eye to the eyepiece and holding the camera in your hand and escorting that lens through the shot. I think that translates very nicely into the notion that creativity is something that happens through the hands. And so I associate filmmaking very much with working with my hands, even though it's an electronic image capturing medium. Um, and there's a lot going on electronically that has nothing to do with touching or handling equipment. I still feel like there's a translation there between my creative intention and the results of what I've rendered uh, through the digits. Um, and therefore you get a, a generation of cinematographers who prefer to do their own camera operating. Um, either way you wanna go, um, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a situation that'll work for you. You'll either have your own operator or you'll do your own operating, whatever. Um, this shot of this operator happens to be Emmanuel Lebeksky, who was also a director of photography. And he's another one who likes to operate his own cameras. He doesn't, he doesn't like there to be a gap between the image acquisition and the moment that it occurs and a monitor 50 or 25 feet away that represents a gap uh, in, the, in the synapse, so to speak. Um, so it's very interesting. We may see an industry that evolves into um, a state where we don't have full-time operators that only operate unless they are also a specialty operator. So there's a specific kind of animal out there in the wild called a steady cam operator. And the steady cam operator has a skill set that not everybody possesses. The steady cam is a very difficult device to learn how to use uh, effectively. Uh, and so there's going to be some folks who can do it and some who just can't. They just don't have the physical dexterity necessary to manage the device. So we'll probably still have specialty operators, um, but we may not see full-time DPs and camera operators on the same show for much longer because it's basically paying double the money for two positions that could function as one. So unfortunately, those days may be numbered for the exclusive camera operator. Um, the first AC, on the other hand, is an invaluable member of the crew, and they're always going to be around. Uh, even in the current state of the industry right now, which is starting to have the early murmurings of embracing autofocus technology, um, strictly speaking, the movie industry has been a manual focus, manual exposure industry from the very beginning. Um, and the, the function of focusing the image has been sort of segregated away from the responsibilities of the camera operator who is composing and following the shots, following the action through the viewfinder. Focus and composition are now two different trades in two different individuals. The first AC is also known as the focus puller. And so we talked about the responsibilities of the focus puller. And the focus puller's pal, the second AC, who is, among other things, the operator of the hallowed slate, the camera marker, the ID at the head of every take that we commit to the camera. The second AC has a very important job, which is to keep track of all the shots that are taken in camera. So they're going to keep track of all the scenes, the scene numbers, the film roll numbers or the media card numbers, uh, the number of takes per shot, um, the amount of coverage in a scene, how many different angles are done, any specific lenses, specific filters that need to be sort of marked down uh, on the notes part portion of the camera report. And then the second AC on a roll by roll and day by day basis compares all of their information with the script supervisor. And that data from the second AC and from the script supervisor get combined and then distributed to the editors and the production coordinator and the unit production manager. The unit production manager and the production coordinator are assembling the show Bible. 
So one set of documents is strictly a record of what happened on a particular production day in terms of camera activities. The production manager might also be looking at things from a budgetary point of view, um, thinking about how much money, for instance, they're spending on film or recording media, or how many times they use multiple cameras in the course of a day and whether or not they need a full-time second camera crew uh, five days a week uh, for filming or not. There may be other reasons why the production manager is looking at the camera reports and the script notes. And then of course the editors need that information because they're assembling a completed film from all of the random parts and clips and pieces that we're creating on set, almost always out of chronological order. Um, and they're making sense of all of that from our notes, from our documents, from our clips and physical footage. And then they are editing and putting together, they're assembling the final product. <clears throat> the second AC has a helper. Uh, and this person is more prominent on film shoots than on digital shoots. And that is the second, second AC or the camera loader. The camera loader's job is physically more challenging when it's a film shoot than it is when it's a digital shoot because of the loading and downloading of magazines, the separating of shot footage to go to the lab and unused footage that can be recanned or, or reloaded into smaller magazines uh, and used on production for um, you know, the, the remainder of the work taking place. Uh, the camera loader has a really important job uh, when you're shooting film because there's so much of the film physically that's passing through the camera that needs to be taken care of. Um, it's a light sensitive medium when it's filmed. So everything has to be done with the absolute um, uh, care uh, and awareness of the, the photosensitive or light sensitive media. Make sure that all magazines get downloaded and, and reloaded in complete darkness. Uh, that the cans of film that have to go to the lab are, are canned up in complete darkness and safety sealed for transport, for shipping and transport. Um, so it's a little bit more harrowing of a job on a film shoot than on a digital shoot. But on the other hand, on the digital shoot, it's never been easier to destroy the footage than by the click of a button uh, on a laptop when transferring files from a card to a hard drive. Um, so uh, asset management for the loader on a digital shoot uh, carries the same amount of responsibility in a different kind of stress, unfortunately. Uh, we don't get to avoid the stress by going film or digital. It just takes a, diff a different form, <laughs> okay? Um, and that individual on a digital shoot is highly uh, reliant on the assistance of and the cooperation of the DIT. So the digital imaging technician is doing a couple of things. The digital, the DIT is helping to um, copy and distribute the content that has been shot on film and data cards are cloned two and three times to make sure that there are safety copies of everything that's been shot because the data cards are gonna get reused. And one of the responsibilities of the loader is gonna be once all of the day's work has been copied and cloned off of the data cards, those cards are then gonna get cleaned off. They're going to get formatted and used again either later that day or the following day. Um, so the DIT is also tracking a set of copies of all the data and distributing uh, data to the editors, the production office, the unit production manager, and so forth. Um, and then also running a real-time color correction uh, assistance uh, protocol uh, for the DP. So most of the time now on um, big budget productions like feature films and, and, and network television, um, they're shooting the images in very low contrast, what we call flat profile image capture. Um, and those images can be to the, to the unindoctrinated, to the inexperienced eye, those images can be very alarming because they don't, they don't look very good. They look kind of muddy and, and they don't look sharp and they don't look saturated, the contrast is flat. Uh, and that's by design. That's because when you capture the images that way, we have a, a greater amount of flexibility in post to do color correction, contrast adjustment, um, uh, detail enhancement, um, all kinds of stuff. 
So we shoot these flat gamma profiles on set. And, but as a result, uh, people like the director, the producers, and random members of the crew that might need to see the images being created, they're going to look at the monitor and they're not going to know how to interpret those, those flat gamma images. So the DIT will do some sort of temporary image color correction on set. They'll apply a look that can be sort of mapped over the data file of the image being created in a non-destructive, non-invasive way that doesn't bake in the information, but gives us a color corrected look at what we just shot. And we can see those images as though they had already gone through post-production with a, you know, a rudimentary set of color enhancements, contrast adjustments, and so forth. So the DIT is not only helping copy and distribute data, but they're also helping with uh, the cinematographer's sort of um, uh, construction of the the overall finished look by using these LUTs and and playing around with you know tweaking the 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 look of the image on on set and then taking notes and sending those notes to the colorist in post production so they have some idea where to start color correcting the film okay and that's done in real time on set and then the last member of the crew that I introduced you to was the camera PA. And I think I mentioned to you folks that the camera PA is probably um, the most important individual from your point of view. And that is, that's the position that most of you will pursue uh, if you're going to uh, pursue a career in the camera department. Uh, it's the entry level position into the industry um, at, a very, at, a, at a medium to high level, okay? So in other words, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to work on a, a TV show that was, let's say you went to Atlanta and you wanted to work on The Walking Dead. Well, The Walking Dead is a union TV show and they're not gonna let you come on board as a cinematographer, even if you were really good at it in college um, because the union has rules and contracts in place uh, that prevent people from sort of going around the people who have already been there waiting in line. And what they'll do is they might take you on based on your resume um, and your GPA maybe from film school, uh, and they might offer you a job as a camera PA, and then you are brought in officially uh, as a member, a non-paid member of the crew, or you might get a stipend. Um, but more importantly than, than anything is, as, a, as an official member of the crew, is you'll be included in the production contract uh, in terms of uh, insurance, like workman's comp, in case you, God forbid, were were hurt on the job, um, you'd be covered uh, uh, legally and effectively through the workman's comp insurances that the production carries on all the crew, okay? If you work on a non a low budget, non-union shoot, uh, you might go in as a second AC, but there will be no measures in place. Uh, nine times out of 10, there's no measures in place in terms of insurance and protections against anyone who gets hurt on the job. Okay, and all I have to do is cite the, the, the most recent example that entered the mainstream that everybody was aware of uh, was about, um, I guess, maybe three years ago. Uh, the young woman uh, who got killed on the, uh, on the movie set up in Georgia who got run over by the train, okay, on a, on a non-union low budget movie um, where the producers had dubious and sketchy insurance policies that really didn't do anything for the girl, uh, for her, you know, relatives and stuff, uh, you know, taking care of her, her, her final expenses and her, you know, um, her unfortunate and untimely death, right? And it ended up that the producers got sued. I think one of them actually went to, to prison for, uh, for that situation. So. Um, if you're going to be a camera uh, production assistant, better to look for um, uh, bigger jobs with uh, maybe union contracts or at least jobs where they have enough of a budget where there is good insurance in place. And then you're there behind the camera, learning from the professionals every day uh, and getting the best possible education you could get. Um, so the camera PA position is something that if you want to pursue a career in the camera department should be a very serious um, um, uh, career option for you. You should think about it very seriously. Having talked about the camera department, the following week we moved into talking about media and storage. So we talked about data cards, talk about 
um, capacities, bit rates, uh, formatting, storage, uh, a number of things, color, color science. Um, the main takeaways from week four were um, talking about um, aspect ratios. We spoke about that first. Understand that there are several aspect ratios out there based on the type of camera that you use or the type of lenses or the type of projection systems that are in the theaters showing your work if you're if you're if you're in theaters um we have uh, the 133 the um television era uh uh um aspect ratio uh which was basically a 4-3 uh rectangle almost square uh the 185 aspect ratio which was the is the traditional theatrical aspect ratio um for regular old digital cinema presentation. And then we have the 235 or the 239 aspect ratio, the widescreen aspect ratio, which represents um, what we call a um, an anamorphic or uh, maybe a cinemascope uh, presentation uh, aspect ratio. And that is either the result of an optical uh, process uh, on a film camera, for instance, um, and then it's a it's an optical squeeze and a projected de-squeeze of the image for presentation in the theater, or now it can be created digitally in the process of creating the images in camera. Uh, the the digitization process in the new cinema cameras can often include a step where the image is actually converted to an anamorphic format. So, but these are the basic three: one three three one eight five and two three five. Um, standard TV, standard def, high definition is 185, and 235 is widescreen. So it's really, when you're thinking about aspect ratio, all about the presentation medium, the exhibition screen that your material is going to be viewed on, okay? So if you have an exhibition uh, for theaters, the screen is going to be a 185 uh, aspect ratio, okay, um, which is 17 by 9. Television is um, 178 uh, aspect ratio, which is 16 by nine, which is what the dimensions are of your television set, nine units by 16 units, okay? Um, if you're doing stuff for the web, uh, you may still be using four three windows with the 133 or 137 aspect ratio. Um, there's still a lot of stuff that is almost square on YouTube. Um, some YouTube seems like it's 185. Some YouTube seems like it's, you know, if especially if it's vintage footage, um, old TV shows and stuff, they're still in 4.3 or 1 or, or TV safe 133 aspect ratio. So the, the way your audience is going to view your material is going to have a lot to do with uh, the aspect ratio that you choose for presentation. And I cited the Grand Budapest Hotel as a kind of a a lighthearted example because uh, on purpose Wes Anderson shot with three different aspect ratios for this movie. So uh, he wanted to honor the traditional aspect ratio that was basically the first uh, 50 or 60 years of the industry was all 137 aspect ratio. Uh, and so some scenes he composed for that square format and he shot that that way. Some scenes he composed in the traditional 185 uh, aspect ratio and then compose the images to fit into that rectangle. Uh, and then some shots he chose to use the widescreen aspect ratio to take advantage of details or sets that he had uh, in the film that would look better under the wider rectangle, the wider aspect ratio. So if you go back and watch that movie again, if, you, if you've seen it before, um, see if you can make note of the transitions in aspect ratio. A lot of them happen so quickly and you can be so engrossed in the story that you might miss the fact that the aspect ratio has changed. Next, I talked to you about the sensor, the, the, the camera sensor. This is our, our acquisition, uh, point of acquisition right here, the camera sensor. They come in different sizes uh, with uh, a few different aspect ratios uh, among their own uh, system of image capture. They are also comparatively uh, by size, vastly different. Uh, this orange perimeter line here is denoting, uh, roughly speaking, the dimensions of a full frame 24 millimeter by 36 millimeter image capture device, or uh, what we would call a full frame 
uh, 35 millimeter film negative, okay, which is technically not true from the standpoint of cinema acquisition. The 24 by 36 millimeter aspect ratio that we now call full frame for video was actually full frame for still photography. Motion picture photography took that 24 by 36 millimeter frame, turned it on its side and chopped it in half because the transport in a film camera in a still camera is horizontal. So you can see in the gate of this Olympus OM-1, you can see a horizontal 24 by 36 millimeter gate, we call it. When the gate opens, light can pass through the lens and strike the film on the film plane, okay? So 24 by 36 millimeters is a photographic aspect ratio, which is now also a digital video aspect ratio. But film through a motion picture camera travels vertically through the gate, not horizontally, with one exception. Um, um, the Lazy 8 format, which was from the, um, the um, uh, VistaVision cameras, the ones that George Lucas used to shoot special effects on, those traveled horizontally through the camera gate. Every other motion picture camera has traveled vertically from the very beginning of the industry. And so vertically speaking, you don't have a 36 millimeter wide frame. You've got a 24 millimeter wide frame by whatever half a 36 is, okay? So what's that, 18 by 24? or 19 by 24, I think it was the official dimension of the super 35 aspect ratio. You'll hear super 35 a lot in terms of digital cameras. And they'll say, yeah, super 35 is nice, but full frame is way better. It's, it's, the, it's the traditional film frame. No, it's not, it, it never was. The traditional cinema frame was half of that, about 19 by 24 millimeters, okay? Which happens to be, a fairly common size with some of these cameras, namely the Blackmagic Design Ursa Minis that you guys have at school. Um, this guy right here, uh, no, that's the GH5. What's this one over here? This one here, I think, yeah, this one's a Blackmagic camera. This is the Pocket 4K. This has a small sensor in it, four thirds, which is comparatively speaking, uh, this green square right here, four thirds, right? It looks like it's maybe a quarter the size of a full frame, and it, it almost is. Okay, Super 35 would be this light orange frame here. And Super 35 happens to be the size of the sensor in the Pocket 6K camera. This one's four thirds. And this one is the GH5. This is micro four thirds. This is a teeny bit smaller again, which is the smaller green square here, micro four thirds. Okay, and you can see how comparatively they're all, you know, one size larger or smaller, depending on which way direction you're going. One size difference from one to the next, okay? All the way down to this small blue square here, which is comparatively speaking about the size in relationship to a full frame sensor, about the size of the sensor in your cell phone, okay? All these cameras have uh, different size sensors in them. The Canon 5D, for instance, has the 24 by 36 millimeter full frame sensor we're talking about, okay? The Ursa Mini has a frame, uh, a sensor that is the size of a traditional motion picture frame. The Super 35 sensor is about, about you know, pretty much the same size as a traditional cinema frame of film, okay? Um, micro Four Thirds and Four Thirds, the GH5 and the um, pocket camera, um, you can see again that comparatively the size and the size of the mount and the size of the sensor inside. The Micro Four Thirds mount has the smallest diameter and the shallowest uh, flange depth of all three of these cameras. But as a result of that, you can adapt lenses from any of these other systems to fit on the Micro Four Thirds because it's so, so small and versatile. Um, the Canon 7D Mark II or the Canon 60Ds that you guys have at UCF, um, those have APS-C size sensors in them, which are almost the same size as Super 35, just a tiny bit smaller, okay? So you can get the same kind of cinematic acquisition format um, in the 7D, the 60D, 
or in the Ursa Mini that you would from a Panaflex, for instance. Okay, and that what that means is basically the, the lenses are gonna react the same way as they did with a traditional film camera. Okay. Um, so the sensor, if we wanna talk about the sensor itself, this is your primary point of capture. It's basically a, a surface that's covered in photosensitive diodes, okay? Um, plus and minus photocytes, we call them, which when ganged together, uh, create image pixels. And there's usually uh, one bit per photocyte, and then there's usually eight bit, six to, well, six to nine bits per pixel, depending on what camera and what sensor we're talking about. It'll vary slightly. I think the new Ursa Mini 12K uses nine uh, bits, nine photocytes per pixel on the new sensor from Blackmagic. Um, the old sensors, um, the technology that is still uh, highly prevalent at this point uh, is the bare image sensor or the bare uh, pattern uh, sensor, which if you looked at it under a microscope would look like a giant red, blue, and green checkerboard. And basically these are the photocytes. They're red sensitive photocytes, green sensitive photocytes, and blue sensitive photocytes. So each time one of these photocytes is struck by uh, light coming through the lens, uh, it's gonna record um, uh, image detail and color uh, in a red, blue, or green bias. And when you combine the results of all three of those together, uh, you get the full spectrum of colors that are that are possible, uh, and you get the the image uh, digital image construct of whatever your subject was. Okay. Um, up close, if you could look at the pixels under a microscope, you'd see here you'd see these photocytes. Each one of them is a red, blue, or green sensitive uh, diode with a lens over it that optimizes the light coming through the, 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 the capture lens, through uh, the flange depth onto the sensor and just kind of focuses that light onto that diode. So the processor can get a really strong read on what information uh, it needs to record here, okay, down on this little silicone diode. Um, the more colors that you have, uh, the more the capability of your sensor, the more colors you can render. Uh, the better uh, the image quality is going to be in your finished image. I gave you kind of an analogy with Crayola crayons, if you recall. Um, the analogy is that we have color divided up into, there's four or five uh, basic matrices, but these are the most common, 8-bit, 10-bit, and 12-bit uh, color depth, all right? 8-bit is the broadcast standard. Um, that means that there are eight color bits for, um, uh, I'm sorry, there are 256 possible colors. And for each red, green, and blue, you get a total possible uh, color set of about 16 million uh, variations on hue and shade. In 10-bit color science, the 10-bit depth, you get 1,024 variations of red, green, or blue, the hue variations. When you combine all those together, um, the possible colors is, this is what? This is, this is 1 billion, right? And then you get over 68 billion at 12-bit color space. Okay, so certain cameras record in 8-bit color space, certain cameras in 10, and certain cameras in 12. There's also 16, and the perfect rendering would be a 24-bit uh, ecosystem but broadcast can't handle the data that would result in a 24-bit image acquisition system. So we go with 8-bit, which is the easiest thing to quantify and then broadcast, especially over the airwaves, okay? 8-bit color science. <clears throat> the 8-bit system is also referred to as uh, REC 709, and it's the broadcast standard for color sampling in a video image, okay? And this is, a, this is the color palette from the REC 709 um, uh, color science. Okay, so you got between zero, which is absolute black, and 255. So that's a total of 256 shades and or hues of color. Okay. So imagine what this would look like at 10 bit with, you know, over a billion or over 68 billion. 
I mean, it would be, <laughs> you know, uh, but I think I gave you the analogy uh, when we did this in class of a video image that you would see like played back on YouTube or played back on the television, uh, an exterior shot of, of something in the foreground and then a whole bunch of blue sky. And a lot of times you'll see wavy lines in the sky or blocking pixel groups in the sky of darker blue or lighter blue. And those are digital artifacts. And what's happening there is the broadcast quality of that image has been reduced to 8-bit from whatever the original file was when it was captured in camera. And because the file was bigger and had more data than the broadcast uh, down conversion can, can show you on TV, you'll get these gaps in the data and the computer does a really bad job of estimating what those uh, missing values would look like. You get really bad transitions, for instance, in uh, a clear blue sky. If you ever looked at a clear blue sky, you'll notice it's kind of darker blue towards the zenith. And as you get closer to the horizon, the blue grades out and becomes more, uh, more light in color, light and shade, right? And it's a nice, to your human eye, it's a nice even transition from the very light blue at the horizon to the deep blue at the top of the sky. But an 8-bit color file can't represent that, that much subtlety in grade. And so the artifacts that result are the banding or striping in the skies or the, or the blocking up of the, of the color uh, quality in the 8-bit file. So 8-bit is really best used as a broadcast exhibition uh, format more than a capture format. If you're limiting yourself to the amount of colors you can capture with initially, you're never going to be able to show anything more than what you started with. So it's always better if you can choose a camera that can shoot in at least 10 bit or maybe even 12 bit uh, color acquisition um, so that when it gets reduced to eight bit for television broadcast or YouTube broadcast, um, you'll still have all that original quality in your original file. And then maybe in five years, the quality of YouTube, the bandwidth of YouTube will be broader and they'll be able to broadcast better images. Uh, but if you started with 8-bit to begin with, no amount of improvements are possible um, because the data won't be there anymore. It will have been compressed and discarded from the original file. Okay. Um, so that's basically color science uh, and aspect ratio and resolution in a nutshell. So what are we going to capture it on? So we're going to capture it on some kind of acquisition media, data cards or hard drives at this point. Um, and we have three primary uh, versions right now. So we've got SD cards, which means secure digital. We have CFast, which is um, the ancestor of the compact flash uh, technology that came out initially for digital photo cameras. Um, CFast, okay, compact flash became compact fast, which is data translation between the camera and the card. Okay, and video has a faster, what we call bit rate, that transfer of information from the camera's processor to the media you're recording on happens in a stream of information. Okay, and the video happens much faster than a photograph happens in terms of an image file. So the original compact flash was no longer going to be sufficient to record video data streaming rates. So we had to go to CFast cards and they represent a certain amount of data speed. And then we have uh, hard drives, which are really more of a capacity advantage than a speed advantage, uh, but they are slightly faster than, uh, than CFast cards. And we talked about bit rates and data flow and everything in week uh, five, I think it was, uh, or four. Um, the SD cards, the fastest of the SD cards right now, the video, uh, like Angel Bird SD cards, for instance, can transfer, can write to the card from the camera uh, in speeds up to about 720 megabits per second. The CFast cards up into the thousands, almost just under 4,000 megabits per second. Uh, and the SSDs, the hard drives, over 4,000 megabits per second. Acquisition write speed and then, of course, the capacities go all the way up to two to four terabytes of space. All right. So if you were shooting high resolution images, 
maybe you set up a locked off camera at a, at a, at a musical concert or something and the concert's three hours long. Right. And you're just going to let the camera roll and just keep taking video. Right. Well, the size of that file at the end of the concert is going to be absolutely enormous. Right. Um, first of all, you're going to need a camera with a fast data rate, a fast bit rate uh, to record the highest quality images as, as, as possible. And then you're going to need, a recording media that can handle that bit rate and handle the amount of data that's going to be represented by three hours of high quality video. Chances are you're going to be recording straight to a hard drive at that point. Uh, the same could be said for folks who do documentaries where you set up the camera and lock it off for an interview that might go for an hour and a half, two hours. Or if you're going to do that with a subject, you're probably going to want to record to an SSD, not a data card at all. Okay. But the most common form of capture uh, right now seems to, to remain uh, the SD card um, because a lot of cameras are still just barely uh, acquiring at 10 bit. A lot of them still offer 8 bit acquisition. Um, and remember, you're limited by your color variations in an 8 bit system. The detail doesn't suffer quite as much in an 8 bit system. Uh, in other words, there's very little um, perceptible difference in in uh, sharpness between 8-bit and and 12-bit but there will be a definite noticeable quality difference in the color saturation so um 8-bit for in terms of resolution in something like um the cameras that you guys can check out from ucf the the uh, fc 1000s um resolution wise that's fine you know uh, you can do 8-bit 4K in terms of detail and, and not suffer at all. But 8-bit in terms of color means you have to get your images perfectly exposed and well lit in order for the colors to render accurately in an 8-bit camera. Um, if you have any problems with uh, illumination, the set's real dark, um, you don't have any supplementary lighting to offer the images and you're recording just basically what's there, what's available, um, and you're doing it with 8-bit, you're probably going to get colors that are not very accurate ultimately uh, in post-production. And, and because you've only got about 256 color varieties to draw from in post-production, your color correction options are going to be limited. Okay, so you want to try for 10-bit acquisition wherever possible uh, and 12-bit if you can get it. So the higher-end Blackmagic cameras all can record in 12-bit. Um, Aria Lexus can record in 12-bit, uh, RED cameras can record in 12-bit, but they also offer the lower uh, color sciences and, and bit rates uh, because sometimes you don't want to shoot the highest possible resolution. Sometimes, you know, you might have a RED camera at your disposal or you might have a Blackmagic camera to your disposal, but all you want to shoot is a YouTube video. Well, you don't want to shoot the highest resolution and deepest color science for a YouTube video. That would be silly because there will be a huge waste of data uh, transferring your original file to a YouTube H.264. So you shoot with a lower, what we call codex, a compression codec, uh, to save data space on your card, to simplify the image capture, and to make it easier to transfer that data up to YouTube, for instance. So we'll cover all of that again here in the next few frames. Um, I offered you guys this little sort of uh, rule of thumb framework here in terms of bits versus bytes uh, to figure out how to compare data. You know that we did a, a little exercise where I taught you how to calculate um, how much recording time you had on a, on a data card based on your camera's bit rate, the capacity of the card, and a couple of other things, you know, the read speed and write speed of the data card itself. In order to figure that kind of thing out, you need to know how these these terms and these and these data states compare. A bit is the smallest component, the smallest uh, um, binary digit. You know, you combine binary dig digit as a portmanteau, you get bit, right? So it's the smallest um, building block in the digital image, right? It's it's a plus or a minus, a one or a zero, an on or an off, a black or a white, right? When you combine eight of those together, you get a byte. Okay. So if a, if, a, um, if a photo site is a bit of information and you get eight of them for a pixel, a pixel is also a byte, right? So 
uh, a byte is a system of ones and zeros up to eight, or in this case, in the new color science, nine, uh, nine binary digits. When you combine those together into kilobytes, you need about a thousand and what is it? A thousand and twenty-four of them. Okay, times eight. Okay, would give you eight thousand one hundred ninety-two binary digits, or one thousand and twenty-four bytes. One kilobyte is a thousand and twenty-four bytes. A megabyte is a thousand and twenty-four kilobytes, and a gigabyte is a thousand and twenty-four megabytes. If you know how that works. You can then calculate how much recording time you have on a data card if you need to know that information. And there's a few times when you might want to know, like if you're shooting that interview for that documentary and you want to know how many minutes you can put on a card. The producer had a bunch of 64 gigabyte cards and they want to know if you can shoot a two hour interview and just let the camera roll. And you're going to do a little bit of math based on the camera you're using and whether or not you're shooting HD or 4K. You're going to compare the uh, the bit stream of the camera. In other words, how fast does the camera write data to the card? And you're going to run all those numbers through this formula right here, and it'll tell you how many minutes you can put on that card. If you're shooting 4K, 24P, with a bit stream of about 150 megabits per second, um, you can't put that two hour video on a 64 gigabyte card. You can put a half an hour of 4K video on that 64 gigabyte card. Okay, but you're only going to know that if you know how fast the camera can write data to a card, what the capacity of the card is, what the write speed of the card is, right? And run all those numbers through the formula and obviously know the difference between bits and bytes. Just as a matter of conversation, if you wanted to look at the cameras available to you at UCF, for instance, through the equipment checkout program, um, you'll see that a 60D is at the bottom of the list in terms of bit rate, it's only 46 megabits per second. And that's shooting in HD. It doesn't shoot 4K, it only shoots HD. So that's as fast as you can record data in HD to this camera in a card in this camera. On the flip side, you could go with um, a Blackmagic cinema camera 4K, an Ursa Mini, and that's gonna record at 312 megabits per second. Okay, in high quality HD. So you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute. If HD in the Canon 60D is only 46 megabits per second, but it's 312 in the Ursa Mini, what's the difference in the quality? Well, the difference is kind of like that, that crayon image I showed you a little while back. This image looks very coarse when you've only got about 512 crayons to use. But if you had 1,024 crayons to use, how fine would the detail be? And from further away, it would be really great detail. And you could look at the image from further away. That's kind of how data works. So <clears throat> this HD file at 46 megabits per second is gonna have very little total volume of data associated with your image. In the same time period, if you capture the same image for the same amount of time in the Ursa Mini 4.6K at 312 megabits per second, your data files are going to be what's 46 into 312? About seven times bigger, seven times as much data. That translates very simply into your ability to do special effects. Uh, with any degree of quality and precision, color correction, heavy color correction, let's say, in post-production, uh, the more data you have in your image files, the more manipulation you can do to those files after the fact, okay? It's a little bit like the difference between 8-bit color depth and 12-bit color depth. The more depth, the more data that you have in a file, the more manipulation of that file can, can happen, okay? And that's really loosely how it translates. Compression is something that happens when you got a lot of data. If you're using this Ursa Mini 4K and you're recording at 312 megabits per second, but you don't want a big data file, then don't shoot in ProRes HQ. You could select ProRes, standard ProRes, which is a 10-bit color depth 
and far less data as a result in the image file than the ProRes HQ. Okay, and you could save room on your data card, for instance. Okay, because if you're going to record high density, uh, deep color science and burn a lot of data, if your data card can hold, um, you know, 64 gigs uh, for 30 minutes at uh, 150 megabits per second, now you've only got 15 minutes at 300 megabits per second. You see what see what I mean in terms of your recording media. So sometimes you don't need as much data because you're not going to do a lot of color correction. And you can either select uh, a heavier compressed file through the Ursa Mini or don't even shoot on an Ursa Mini, shoot on a 60D instead. Okay. So part of what goes into your selection of a camera is how it handles data, how it manages data. Okay. And how many different compression schemes are offered in that camera to help you conserve data on your acquisition media, to help you decide and control how deep you want the color science based on how much post-production you anticipate, all right? If you're shooting Star Wars and you're doing all of these spaceships in outer space and all these special effects and all this CGI, you can't shoot a movie like that in 8-bit. It would be an absolute disaster because every time you try to key in a green screen or put in a CGI element, uh, it would look horrible. It would look like it was done in 1989, okay, on really bad television. You remember the bad special effects that we used to have on some of those TV shows, you know, back in the day? Where you could see, for instance, uh, the weird, you know, magenta uh, halos around subjects that had been pulled off of a green screen, right? You could, you could see it. You could tell, Right. That was because the color science wasn't very good in terms of the digital special effects. And they transferred all that from film, which was a medium with higher, higher um, uh, value and detail uh, and submitted it to a post-production process that was inferior to the capture uh, medium in the first place. And so the special effects were doomed to look bad until the digital video got good enough to look as good as film. Now it's very hard to tell uh, where the CG stops and the real image begins. Look at the Mandalorian in some of those scenes and see if you can figure out what's CG and what's really happening in camera. It's hard to tell. Compression is another portmanteau word. It's a combination of compression, decompression. Okay, so it's referring to an algorithm that reduces the size of a data file by taking superfluous data and just tossing it out. Okay. If you took that image of that exterior in the desert we were talking about with the detail in the foreground and the big blue sky in the background, anything in the foreground that has detail at all is gonna soak up data. It's gonna need the data to record the detail. The blue sky doesn't really need as much data, not nearly as much data as you would need to record detail in a cactus, for instance. So what compression will do is it'll go into that image file and it'll look for redundant data that it doesn't need to construct that image. And it'll take the redundant data and it will just toss it out, okay? That's what compression is basically doing. So sometimes you want heavy compression because the images don't really have a lot of detail in them that you wanna preserve, or you might not want compression. Like if you're shooting uh, a, a big budget television show and you wanna make sure that you have the highest possible quality original files that you're gonna save in a vault for years and maybe make copies off of every once in a while, uh, you might not want compression in your, in your image files. So you'll shoot what we call the raw uncompressed video, okay, which is that flat, uh, flat gamma video I was talking about earlier. You'll shoot in the raw codec, or raw is technically the absence of a codec, um, and then you have massive data files in your original that you can then make lower res copies from for whatever media you're gonna exhibit on. You don't need nearly as much data to, to exhibit on YouTube as you do to exhibit on television. And you need less data to exhibit on television than you do in the theater, okay? So where you're gonna see the image is gonna dictate what kind of camera you're gonna shoot on and what kind of video files you're gonna need, okay? So that was the nightmare of week four. 
Week five was uh, a little bit of a mental break. All we did really in week five was build a camera and talk about the kind of parts and accessories you might want to build a camera. Uh, and one of the main takeaways that I wanted to, to impart to you in week five was the notion that there's no such thing as, as the best camera. There is no such thing because everybody's needs are different. Every production's needs are different. Every story's needs are different. And therefore, there's no one camera that's going to do everything perfectly without some kind of compromise. And sometimes the compromise is the opposite of what you would think. Maybe the camera is so good, the data files are so massive, you can't do anything with it because your computer can't handle the size of the files coming out. So that camera, as good as the images are, is not the best camera for you because you don't have the infrastructure to deal with the images from capture through post-production, okay? Or you're never gonna, you're never gonna project your images in a theater uh, the best you're ever going to do is, is television or web, web broadcast. And if it's web broadcast, HD is totally fine. You don't need 4K and you certainly don't need 6K or 8K, right? So the perfect camera there for you might still be a Canon 5D Mark III or Mark IV. That might be your perfect camera. Um, so... The best camera really, I think, can be reduced to one simple notion, and that is the best camera is, does anybody remember what I said? The one you can get your hands on. The one you can access right now if you have to shoot right now. I.e. this thing, for example. Could Bad be example, your cell phone. Absolutely. Could be your cell phone. example, but still an example. Because a professional can take this tool and get a good result from it by understanding the limitations and by shooting within the constraints of the technology. And don't try to shoot Star Wars on a cell phone, right? But you could shoot Tangerine on a cell phone and be nominated for an Academy Award. Or you can shoot a TV series for the uh, internet, for YouTube, uh, if you're Jeff Soderbergh. Okay, because this represents an opportunity to access a market that is more affordable using this device than it is using a traditional cinema camera. Okay, so you should be at home using an Arri Alexa Mini Studio or an Arri 65 with a $110,000 lens package and a 60 man crew and everything else you can think of, all the bells and whistles. That sh you should be equally comfortable functioning there as functioning on a low budget local commercial with a Canon 5D and know the things that are possible at the, at the big level, at the higher level and know the things that are possible at the, at the low indie level and don't shoot outside of your, um, your capability. Okay. You could probably get a few good, you probably get some good quality pictures from a cell phone. Sure you can. And some of these cell phones are pretty darn uh, complex now. I mean, this one is uh, iPhone, I think it's an eight. We got an iPhone six, so. And this thing shoots 4K and it's got an image stabilizer in it. So, you know, if I wanted to, I could shoot some very interesting and acceptable images with this. The limitation here is going to be the size of the capture device. The image sensor is very, very small. So there's gonna be some image quality issues with that. And then the amount of data I can record in here is gonna be fairly small, okay? But it can be done, right? So know your limitations of your gear and your help and your budget, and then stick within those constraints and you'll be fine. I talked to you about rental houses. Rental houses are a real valuable asset to have in the community. And here in Orlando, we've got three or four of them. Uh, a couple of them locally will deal with, with students. Um, and a couple of them are professional rental facilities where you've got to have special liability insurance and stuff to rent gear from them. So you wouldn't do it as an individual, but you might work for a production company that rents from places like VER, for instance, down off of uh, St. Cloud uh, or no, St. Cloud Boulevard, I think it is. Um, 
But places like uh, the Lens Depot, these guys here, which are right over in Oviedo, um, they'll accept the UCF uh, insurance that covers you guys when you rent gear and when you shoot off campus and they'll rent gear to you. So if you want to try a camera that's uh, new on the market, but you can't afford to buy it and UCF doesn't have it in inventory for you to check out for free, they might have it at the Lens Depot and then you go down there and you rent it from them. And it's a way for you to try out the technology without having to front the money to buy the thing. And then if you don't know if you even like the device to begin with, um, it's better to rent it for a hundred bucks and, and shoot with it for five days and return it uh, and find out whether you like it or not before you drop say $4,000, $6,000 on something. Let's say you were intrigued by the new red Komodo camera, right? You got $6,000 to go run out and buy one? Probably not. You could probably rent it from Lens Depot though and see if you even like working with the RED ecosystem. You know, there's little idiosyncrasies about RED cameras that a lot of people don't like. And a lot of it has to do with the cost of accessories and the compatibility of their data matrices, their codecs and things. Uh, they don't work with every computer system or every NLE very easily without a lot of fiddling around. And that frankly annoys a lot of people. And so they don't use RED cameras because of that. Um, but you're not going to know that until you rent the thing and try it. And you might rent it and say, man, what a piece of junk. I'm glad I didn't blow six grand on it. Or, wow, I love that camera. I'm going to save my money and I'm going to go out and buy one as soon as I got an extra six grand, you know, or I'm going to wait for UCF to buy some so I can check them out and use them on my, on my, you know, student projects, whatever the case may be. All right, so a rental house uh, can be very uh, useful in that respect. It can also be a good place for supplementary equipment. You know, for instance, UCF doesn't carry gimbals. I've begged them to. Um, they have, they've yet to purchase them. They don't carry lots of different kinds of equipment for lack of funding uh, for budget restraints that, that they have in the department. So if you want to use a piece of gear from one of your upcoming film projects, like let's say you want to use a set of, um, a set of uh, uh, um, Cook, mass, uh, Cook uh, S4 cinema primes. Well, they don't have those at U UCF and they're probably never going to because each one of those lenses costs about $10,000 a piece. So a set of six or eight of those is, you know, 60 or $80,000. It's probably not something UCF is going to buy for you guys. Um, and, you know, so, but if you wanted to go to a rental house and rent them, you could probably rent them, right? And shoot with them on your projects and see what it feels like to shoot with the same lenses that Roger Deakins likes. Um, but there's lots of advantages to the rental house. <clears throat> As a professional, you'll rely on the rental houses. So, uh, adopting a relationship early with say the Lens Depot right here in Oviedo might be one of the smartest things that you could do so that when you graduate and you start working out in the industry as a professional, as a freelancer, you have a relationship with a rental house and they can help you sometimes with solutions to your client's problems like, you know, renting gimbals, renting easy rigs, renting, they got, you see here, they got quadcopters, they got camera rigs, They've got lighting, they've got, you know, lenses and camera bodies and all kinds of stuff. So it's going to be a good relationship for you to develop and you might as well start early. So that's my, that's my thing about rental houses. Um, the other thing we talked about in week five was, you know, how we build out a camera to suit our production needs, right? And I use this graphic kind of as a joke more than anything else, because it represents the most idiosyncratic, ridiculous build I could think of, which is everything possible mounted to this little 5D camera, right? So there's an external monitor because the 5D's little uh, three inch screen doesn't articulate. So you got a bigger monitor with a bigger image and you can swivel it around and look at it from more than one angle. Uh, there's a C-cage wrapped around the camera, so you can bolt all these ridiculous accessories to the 5D, including a top handle. There's a shoulder rig bolted to the bottom of this thing, so you could use it like a video camera and mount the camera on your shoulder and get your handheld shots with some stability. There's an extra battery that will improve the amount of time that your camera can stay powered up before you have to swap for a new battery uh, supply. Um, 
there's a focus wheel, uh, focus assist extension. If you're going to do some handheld work and you want your uh, your first AC to be able to reach the focus wheel if you're running around and, and recording a lot of action. There's a matte box to hold your filters and block this, this, you know, the sun from flaring your lens, all of this stuff. You can do this to a camera and you can take something like a 5D, which might have the perfect acquisition system for you, the perfect sensor for your job, but it's a little tiny camera that, you know, um, let's face it, sometimes this isn't a practical mode to work in, right? For whatever reason, like handheld, for instance, in a tiny camera, it's really hard sometimes to get a really nice stable frame because the camera's so small and light that every micro jitter that you do with your arms or your hands gets recorded on the image frame. And when you blow it up on your 60 inch TV in your living room, you can see all the jitters in your video and you're very unhappy with your handheld work. That's when you might want a shoulder system. Put that under the camera with a shoulder pad and a counterweight and a couple of big handles out front so that you can stabilize the camera a little bit better and get smoother frames and smoother pans that don't look quite so shaky. Whatever the reason is, you can build these cameras out as much as you want or not. You don't have to. There's no rule that says you have to build a camera out just because it started as a mirrorless camera, for instance. Just because this is a small mirrorless camera doesn't mean it's not a useful tool to capture your video with. It just means that it has a certain kind of workflow that it was intended for if you're going to use it unaided. Okay. But you don't have to because you can build the thing out. And there's a number of manufacturers out there that will offer this type of stuff. All you really usually need to get going is a base plate with a set of rods. We call this a rod bed, right? It's got a place to mount the camera right here. It's got a place to mount to your tripod. And then it's got uh, little brackets that hold these support rods, these 15 millimeter support rods. From those rods, you can attach all kinds of stuff. Your focus assist lens supports for longer lenses, oops, excuse me, your external, uh, your bigger battery uh, supply, um, your map box, um, all kinds of stuff can mount to the rod system if you have at least a base, uh, a rod base like this. If you go on Amazon, look for any one of these manufacturers and you can find a whole catalog of parts, little bits and bobs that you can mount to your camera to build it out to do whatever it is you need it to do, right? In the current digital world, what we do is the very first thing we do is we select a sensor, right? What sensor is going to do the best job for you in terms of data collection, color accuracy, detail, and resolution, um, and then whatever other criteria you have for your image itself. And then you find out the cameras that that sensor is loaded into, right? Might be that you like the sensors that are in red cameras, or you like the sensors that are in black magic cameras, or you like the sensors that are in the Arri Alexa cameras, or the Panasonic cameras, whatever it is, you determine the sensor and the gamma uh, technology that you prefer. And that's usually uh, brand oriented. And then once you know which preference you have, select the cameras that have those qualities and then if it's if it's a little guy like this, you know, the, the cinema gamma in the processor of this camera in this little $600 camera is the same gamma that I had on my $16,000 Varicam. Same color science because they were both Panasonic cameras. But one of them is a little dinky job like this and the other one was a big ENG camera. Okay. Just find the tool that is fits your need and then build it out however you have to. Once you do that, the next thing you got to think about is your lenses. And that was what we talked about in week six. So in week six, we talked about cinema lenses. We talked about the difference I showed you. I don't have my uh, zines with me here tonight. Um, but we talked about, for instance, the difference between photographic lenses and cinema lenses. And I showed you different varieties. Like I show you um, the uh, photographic version of the uh, Sigma 11 to 16. And then I suggested to you that there was a cinema zoom version and that there were some subtle differences between the two lenses. Not the least of which is the build quality of this cinema zoom 
is amazing, this lens weighs about twice what this lens weighs. This lens has all the manual functionality that a cinematographer is going to want. It's got manual focus. There's no autofocus in this cinema lens. It's a cinema zoom lens. It's manual focus. So I need a first AC to use this lens. I also have manual control over my iris by turning this wheel here and manual control over my focal length here. Well, this lens, if you put it on a Canon 5D, I can control the iris and the focus through the Canon 5D with this lens. I can't do it with this lens, but I don't work that way anyway. And I don't use a Canon 5D. So if I've got my GH5 or my, you know, my Ursa Mini or my pocket cinema camera, I'm gonna put a cinema lens on there because I'm used to working in the cinema style of acquisition, right? I usually have a, a, a camera assistant or two. Uh, somebody's pulling focus. I'm operating. I got a second AC helping with lens changes and doing the slates. Okay. That's how I work. That's my preferred method. You might be on a documentary though, all by yourself with a very small budget. And there's only three or four of you on the total crew. And that's fine. And then you might want a 5D because you can have autofocus. And you can have a smaller camera that's easy to carry around when you're also lugging around other stuff, coolers and chairs and all the other implements that you might need to shoot at a location for five or eight hours, right? So the camera is not your only concern. Qualify your tools and then pick the right tool for the right job. There is a difference between cinema lenses, for instance, and photographic lenses. So here's, a, here's an Olympus manual focus photographic lens, right? And then I might show you uh, a 50 millimeter cinema lens. I don't have my 50 out right now. Um, but here's a autofocus uh, from Sigma. And look at the size difference in there just between a manual focus lens from 85 and a, and a, and a autofocus lens from uh, 95 or, or 2005, I think. Right. So there's differences like that in the size and the physicality of these lenses, and they are for very good reason. The biggest reason that we talked about the cinema lenses being physically larger, especially with bigger barrels, was to facilitate the manual focus required by a cinema lens that's typically done by the first AC. If you have a very long turn on a cinema lens, you can get very fine control over how fast the focus shifts from the foreground to the background, for instance, if you want to do a, a, a focus throw, start on a fine detail in the foreground, like a flower or a, you know, a, a cocktail, and then throw the focus to the individual that's going to drink the cocktail or sniff the flower, right? And the focus will go from the foreground to the midground. And that transition is a very dramatic statement on the part of the filmmaker. How fast or slow that that happens is usually very premeditated. And the director will choose the speed or the cinematographer will choose the speed based on the emotion they want to elicit from the audience that's looking at this image. Still photographic lenses are designed to work in a certain kind of ecosystem. So if you have a still camera and you're taking individual frames, photographs for a fashion shoot or for a magazine article, you're the photographer, you're focusing your lens yourself, setting your apertures yourself, maybe out, outside or internally, right? And you're taking, boom, one frame at a time, one frame at a time. If you're shooting the basketball game, you don't want a big lens that takes forever to turn and get the image in focus if you got three seconds for the guy to from the free throw line to the hoop to do a layup you want to find him and focus boom and snap the picture at the moment where he's at the top of the stuff right if you got a cinema lens it takes a long time to achieve focus that's not a practical tool for a still photographer that's the kind of tool you want if you're shooting a movie and you've got a focus puller and it's a very dramatic scene with some very uh, intense dialogue and a person in the foreground is going to say something and the person in the background behind them is going to react and you're going to throw from this from the line of dialogue to the background and the reaction from the other individual and you want that to be a very premeditated amount of time like a pause in the dialogue or the action 
so your audience can catch up with whatever that emotion is, right? Cinema lenses are for a totally different way of working than still lenses. But that doesn't mean that the quality from a still photographic lens couldn't be every bit as good as the quality from a cinema lens. Cinema lenses are more expensive because they tend to be bigger. They tend to be hand fitted or handmade. They're made in smaller batches and they're made of dur more durable materials in most cases than the photographic lenses are. Like all the Canon photo lenses tend to be plastic. But if you take a look at any cinema lens, even the DZO stuff right now, the Vespid Primes, they weigh a ton because they're all aluminum spun barrels with built-in focus gears and a lot of mechanics so that they're durable and they can function in a cinematic mode. All of that adds to the cost and the value of cinematic lenses versus still lenses. Differences range. Uh, the physicality of a still photographic lens, for instance, here's a a Samyang or a Rokinon 35 millimeter lens for still photography. And here's a Rokinon 35 millimeter cinema build. Okay. Some people say, oh, this is nothing more than a still lens that's been, you know, they put pitch gears on. No, this lens was purpose built to work as a cinema functioning lens. And this one was purpose built to act as a photo functional lens. The biggest way to know is you got this rubber gripper surface here. So you can operate this lens by hand, okay? If you operate the gears on a cinema lens with your bare hands over the course of a day or a couple of days, your, your finger is gonna be all tore up because you're supposed to be using a focus assist wheel with a cinema lens. And then you're not coming in direct contact with the lens barrel, you're turning the wheel, this, this guy right here, this thing here, right? You don't need that with a still photographic lens. You just need a rubber grip surface so you can focus real quick and take your picture. The um, the photographic lens, the f-stops, it doesn't, doesn't even have an f-stop ring on this particular lens. Oh, actually, there it is right there. Some of them don't, like the modern Canon. Here's a Sigma for Canon. There's no f-stop ring on this lens. It would be right here if there was gonna be one and it's not there because this lens is made to electronically function uh, through the camera. There's buttons or knobs on the camera where you adjust the aperture, that is the size of the opening of the lens through the camera. You make that adjustment by, by the camera menu, not by hand. That's no good for the cinema process because all the operator is doing is composing the frame and following the action through the shot. If they've also got to set the, the f-stop through the camera, that's an added responsibility that might draw them away from the critical moment where the composition needed to change, okay? So you can't use a photographic digital lens these days for uh, cinema, unless again, you're a one-man band and you can control that f-stop through the camera. Some cameras you can do that, some cameras you can't. The cinema build on this 35 millimeter lens has the pitch gears built in for the focus assist. It has a manual iris control ring here, which also has gears on it. So you could put uh, a focus motor on this lens and an f-stop motor on this lens and operate the whole thing from eight or 10 feet away with a remote control. So that if you were on a steady cam, for instance, the steady cam can run around the room or down the hall and the camera assistant will just drop from behind and adjust the f-stop and adjust the focus accordingly uh, by eye on the fly, okay? So the cinema, cinema lenses are built specifically to work in our medium, okay? Here's your focus puller, here's your first AC. You notice how she's got one hand on the wheel and she's looking down range at the action that's happening judging the distance from the camera to the action, and then she's adjusting the wheel accordingly. So she's focusing, uh, hopefully not relying too heavily on the monitor as a focus assist, but she's relying more on maybe measurements she took with a tape measure, uh, or she's, she's doing it on the fly by eye. Ah, she's so good now that she can, she can guess how far six feet away is from the lens or how far eight feet away is and from the lens and manually focus that lens without having to look through the viewfinder at all. You can get just that good if you've been doing it for a while. 
the device you're going to use to do that is the focus assist. And you can see here it's got a small wheel with gears on it. And that gear is made to mesh with the pitch gears on the on the cinema lens. You can't mesh your focus assist with this lens because there is no focus gear on here. But you can adapt it if this is all you got to work with and you have a focus assist and you have a first AC that can pull focus, then you need to adapt this tool to this job by adding this pitch gear to your photographic lens. And then you can use your focus assist with your photographic lens. In this case, it looks like a 24 to 105 Canon zoom, which is a nice lens. There's a lot of pros that shoot video that use this photographic zoom lens because it's really good quality, but you got to mess with it. You got to adapt it. You got to put a, a focus gear on it so you can use your focus assist and you might have to get a special mount adapter to go from whatever camera you're using to the native mount on the lens. This lens is a Canon lens. This is an Airy cinema camera. The Airy cinema camera doesn't have a Canon EF mount on it. It has an Airy PL mount on it. So you have to get an Airy PL adapter that will convert the camera's lens flange to accept the Canon EF lens. So you got to do two really um, significant things to that Canon 24 to 105 if you want to use it on the Airy camera. Get a mount adapter or a flange adapter and get a pitch gear for the lens. And then you can do it. If you really, really like the look out of that 24 to 105 Canon, you've had it for years and you've, it's been with you through thick and thin. And, and every time you shoot with it, you're pleased with the images, the color quality, the saturation, the contrast. And you can't, you can't see spending you know, good money after bad on a cinema zoom where the results aren't going to be any better and maybe not as good as the 24 to 105. Well, you can still use it. Just understand that that equipment will have some drawbacks and it'll have to be modified to work as a cinematic tool, okay? Um, I talked about the cinema lenses having a long focus throw for those dramatic focus changes. Traditionally speaking, and here's that 24 to 105 Canon zoom, the focus scale from minimum focus to infinity on a still photographic lens is next to nothing from minimum to maximum. So if I'm on minimum focus right here, I'm already at infinity. That's like two micro turns on that lens, right? Whereas a cinema lens to go from minimum to maximum I might be turning that thing for quite a while. This one's actually a pretty short throw because it's such a wide angle lens. But let's say on my 20 to 70 uh, cinema zoom over here, here's infinity and minimum focus is way down here. How many times did I turn that lens barrel one, to get from one extreme to the next? Eleven times, right? This one I turned just about two. <laughs> Photographic lens, cinema lens. Focus throws will be a lot harder to nail precisely with the photo lens because the difference between four feet and five feet might be that much turn on the lens. There's no way to get a tangible sense of that change or that difference with the photographic zoom lens. But with this lens, the difference between say four and six feet might be one, two, three turns just to get from four feet to six feet on the cinema zoom. And I was only two turns to get from minimum to maximum on the photo zoom. So you can see how the focus puller might have a bear of a time getting really accurate focus throws or really accurate precise point of focus with a photographic lens as opposed to a cinema lens, okay? <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of the quality of a cinema lens would be uh, in something we call breathing, okay? And I talked about this before with you guys. Basically, breathing is the sense that an out-of-focus image gets smaller as it becomes sharper in focus, and as it goes out of focus, it blows up and becomes a blob. 
And it's really uh, illustrated well in this little gif right here, which is the uh, film riot coffee cup in the, in the foreground. And then a, there's a baby monitor or something in the background. It's a big white blob when it's out of focus, but when they throw the focus from the foreground to the background, watch this thing change shape. So that change in size, that smaller, larger, smaller, larger. <sighs> That's where we get the phrase focus breathing from. Okay, it's kind of a, an analogy really of what's going on here. But that can be, depending on what the content is, you know, it could be a very distracting aspect that is, or a distracting um, flaw, you could say, uh, in the visuals that might be just too distracting for the audience to be able to focus on maybe a critical piece of dialogue uh, while they watch the, you know, you're throwing back and forth. Let's say that's a person in the background and a person in the foreground, and they're talking about something really uh, life-threatening or critical in the story point. And every time you throw it from one person to the other, they just become these big out-of-focus blobs. That could be really disturbing or, or distracting for your audience. This aspect of focus breathing is much more prominent in a photographic lens than it is in a cinema lens, okay? By adding extra um, elements of glass into the physical makeup of a cinema lens, you can reduce this, this breathing phenomenon uh, and you can in many cases totally eliminate it uh, through cinema design uh, as opposed to you know, still lenses they're not designed to, to capture a transition from foreground to background while the camera is exposing. It's designed to capture a foreground image or a background image, but not both at the same time. So focus breathing in a still photographic lens is no big deal. It's not even a, it's not even a, consider, a consideration. But in a cinema lens where the camera is turning on information in the foreground and then transitioning to information in the background while the camera is still recording, we can't have breathing. Okay. Um, and then the difference between T-stops and F-stops. Still photographic lenses are talking about one variable in the exposure process in, in terms that are formulaic. In other words, F-stops, which are formula stops, okay, are a calculation of the diameter of your front objective and the focal distance of your lens inside the barrel, okay? Those two measurements, when they are, I think they're, yeah, divided. The, the focal depth is divided by the diameter of the objective and you get N, which is your F-stop number, your F number, right? The problem is with an F number is it's a mathematical calculation. So the front objective of my cinema lens is the same as the front objective of my photographic lens. But my photographic lens tells me my maximum aperture, the biggest size I can achieve is 2.8. And this one says the maximum size I can achieve is 3.0. Well, there's a little bit of a difference there in terms of exposure uh, when you're calculating for the right bright, brightness or darkness of your image. Um, what's the difference then? Well, the difference is the cinema lens takes into account all this glass that's inside. Okay, and one of the one of the laws in physics governing waves uh, that propagate is that a wave changes frequency as it enters mediums of different densities. Okay, so light traveling through air has one reflection angle, but the minute it hits a piece of glass, the reflection angle will change, which is what is illustrated by these blue and red lines going through the lens. You see this one here how it enters at one vector and exits at a different vector. That's because the density of the glass has changed the reflection angle of that ray of light. And it happens in a lens with six or 14 or 24 elements, all doing things like zoom focal lengths and telephoto focal lengths, extreme wide angle focal lengths, cinema lenses with um, breathing engineered out of them have more elements than photo lenses. And therefore, the density of the glass represents a change in your exposure by virtue of all the reflection angles changing. So 
the way a cinema lens is calibrated is they wait and measure the amount of light coming through all that glass. And then they put that into an equation that includes your f-stop information plus your transmission information. The formula looks like this and you get a slightly different number. And you're gonna to say to me, who cares? And nine times out of 10, I would say nobody, except that technically the lenses can look different at equivalent f-stops and t-stops because of the density of the cinema lens. If you shot a wide shot in a scene with a photographic 35 millimeter lens, and then you wanted to go in and shoot a close up with a cinema 85 millimeter lens. The F stop you calculated for your wide shot at 35 millimeters on the photo lens was say a four. Then you put the cinema 85 on there and you go to shoot your close up and you look at your monitor and the image is too dark. And you say, what happened? I set the lens to a four, just like I did with the 35 millimeter. And then you realize, oh, the 85 works with T stops because there's way more glass in this lens than there is in the 35 millimeter photo lens. And I have to open up to a 2.8 to brighten the image up and shoot at a 2.8, right? So that's the difference between a lens with a T-stop and an F-stop. If my 35 millimeter lens was calibrated with T-stops and I chose a four, then when I went to my 85, that was also calibrated in T-stops, the four would be correct information and it would work equally with each lens because each lens was calibrated after the light passed through it to determine that X amount of light equals a four or a two eight or a five six, okay? And the photo lenses are not calibrated that way. There's a video on web courses in, in week six uh, that you can look at again, it's by Matt Granger and it's, uh, it's called F-stops versus T-stops, I think, what's the difference? And you can check that out again if you want the full blown argument. But that's essentially what it is. T-stops are a little bit more precise way of measuring the amount of light going through your lens. That's going to make more sense to you next week when we start talking about exposure than it, than it makes sense now because you haven't been asked the question, what is exposure yet? And we haven't looked at that situation. Next week, we're going to deal with that. The last week was filters. That was just last week, week seven. We talked about filters, all the different kinds of filters. I told you about uh, Ira Tiffin, the founder of the Tiffin Filter Company. There's this video you can check out on web courses where he talks about what he thinks are the five most critical filters for video. We talked about the styles of filters, threaded filters, filters that are gelatin, filters that are glass or resin, okay? Uh, with the circular threaded filters, the, the one consideration that we had was if you have a whole lens set, a whole, you know, whole bunch of lenses, whether they're photographic or cinema lenses, you might have different accessory sizes for each lens uh, in a system. If you use threaded round filters, uh, what you'll end up having to do is buy several different sizes of the same filter effect, or you buy one set of filters in the largest size necessary for your set and then you adapt all those filters to the smaller lens sizes by virtue of what we call step-up rings. And step-up rings just reduce the size of a filter, where are mine, to the size of the lens barrel. So I got a whole nest of them right here. And basically the biggest size uh, in here that I have in the stack at the moment is 82 millimeter, all right? And it steps down from 82 to 77 in one ring. So the male thread is 77, the female thread is 82. So if I had an 82 millimeter lens, uh, filter rather, and I wanted to put it on my 77 millimeter accessory size zoom lens, I would need an 82 to 77 step down ring, okay? And so this nest goes all the way down to 49 millimeters. Each time you're stepping down one lens size. So it's 49 to 52, 52 to 55, 55 to 58, 58 to 62, 62 to 72, 72 to 77, 77 to 82. And that's pretty much the full range of prosumer filter sizes in round. Professional round filters, you can get them up to uh, 114 millimeters with a thread on them. 
Uh, but can you imagine buying round filters, 114 millimeters wide? Um, if my 80, if my 77 millimeter um, polarizer costs me $60, imagine what an 114 millimeter polarizer would cost, probably about $600, okay? So there's a system that we use in that situation to avoid the expense and complexity of threaded filters and we call them cut glass. Okay, so we have threaded, threaded rounds. Uh, we have rat and gel filters, which we used to use in the old film cameras. You cut off a little square of whatever you needed to fit in the little trap door that goes behind the cinema lens in the port of the camera, and you can color correct your images. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore because on the digital cameras, we can just dial in whatever color sensitivity we want the camera to have. So for shooting under artificial lighting on a film stage, we tell the camera to color balance for artificial light. And then when we go outside to shoot something, we tell the camera, okay, now we've gone outside color balance to daylight. And we change that in the menu system and the camera just sees that light in a different, whole different color, in a whole different way and a whole different color bias, okay? Uh, so the old way of film uh, correction of the camera for the film stock's sake, was done with rat and gels. We don't have to do that anymore. Okay, cut uh, resin gels are similar to cut glass gels in that you have the same kinds of effects, the same quality, the same optical clarity, um, but in a much smaller, thinner, and cheaper uh, article, right? This little Koken 80, looks like an 85B, uh, 85 color correction filter might cost you $20 on Amazon. If you get it in a cut glass version, the cut glass version is probably going to cost you about two to $250. Okay. And that's for the smallest four by four version. If you get bigger, they go all the way up to six by six, that same 85 millimeter cut glass filter might cost you four or 500 bucks. Okay. If you're renting your filters to productions and you're working on feature films all the time, the filters, no matter what you pay for them, will ultimately pay for themselves. Uh, and then once they do that, they can create an, a nice little extra bit of income for you if you have a set of filters. So I, I have a series, I've got about, I don't know, I think about, about 20 maybe, cut glass four by four filters. So I've got about $4,000 invested in professional filters, but they've paid for themselves over time. Every time I rent them now, even if I rent them for a couple dollars a piece for a production per day, uh, whatever that money equates to is free and clear gravy for me because the filters, I've been renting them out for 25 years, 20 years, and they paid, for, they paid for themselves 10 years ago, right? So I've been making money with them ever since. So sometimes, you know, investing in gear can be a good thing in terms of your, your, uh, your total uh, financial gain, uh, how you earn your money, right? Um, if you like the Coke and style and you want to experiment with different kinds of filters, um, you can do it much cheaper going with the cut resin um, because you don't have to, you buy one set of filters and you just use an adapter and an adapter ring. Here's a Coke and filter adapter and there's a ring that fits inside of it and you get that ring based on whatever lens accessory sizes you have. This one I think is a 77, yeah, 77. You see that circle with a slash through it? All right, and that just goes into the filter holder. And then from there, you take your Coke and filter, whatever you're gonna use. Here's that 85 we just looked at. And it's about an eighth of an inch thick, not very thick but it slides right into these grooves in the filter holder, just like it would, like a bigger cut glass would slide into a matte box. And it's kind of like putting a mini matte box on front of your camera, except there's no eyebrow for it, but it'll hold two or three filters at one time. And you can experiment with different looks very inexpensively using this series of filters, okay? Um, and there's reasons why you might want to use filters. Just because we're in the age of digital uh, cameras and digital software doesn't necessarily mean we want to use digital filters. 
you can do this. You can do 85B color correction in post-production just as easily as using a filter. That's not the issue. The issue is gonna be if you need to use a polarizer. We talked about what a polarizer does. A polarizer takes a reflection out of a, out of a surface in your video. You can't do that in post-production. The image is either there or it's not there. Okay, so if you have a reflection in a, in a windscreen on your car, on your, what, what are your windshield, right? If you don't do that in camera at the time you record that scene, that reflection will be there the whole time and you can't get rid of it in post. The other thing you can't do really well in post is diffusion. As a uh, response to that, I gave you a video uh, in web courses and it's a Tiffin uh, analysis video of, I think they check like a dozen different Tiffin diffusion filters, the different styles. Uh, and they'll show you the image with and without the diffusion. Uh, and there's two models. So there's a woman of color and then there's a, a, a white woman sitting next to each other. And you can see the difference that the diffusion has with and without, and you can see the difference that diffusion has on a light-skinned person or a dark-skinned person. So you get a really good sense of what that diffusion filter is doing in a lot of different scenarios, okay? That's something you can't do real well in post-production, if, if at all. The digital diffusion filters don't work very well. The other thing you can't do really well in post-production is uh, the uh, graduated filters I talked to you guys about, where they... Uh, have a grad over the sky and nothing over the foreground. A lot of times you can't do that in post either um, because there's a grade that has to happen somewhere in the middle and you got to do a lot of keyframing and a lot of different fiddling around to get that transition effect in post. It's a lot easier sometimes to do it, take an extra 30 seconds, drop that filter in your map box or screw it on the front of your lens and get your shot and move on to the next piece you got to get as opposed to dealing with it in post-production where you might pay somebody a very high rate to fiddle around with that image in post. And it could be as high as $400 an hour to do what you could have done for free in 30 seconds on set in camera at, at the time of capture. Sometimes it's more economical to do things in camera than it is to wait until later. Okay. The, the, the compromise doing it in post is you can change your mind, you can do other things, or you can not do it at all. Um, but that comes at a higher price, okay? Because if you didn't do it and now you want it, it's either going to be impossible or extremely expensive. If you're inspired to do something in camera at the time of acquisition uh, and you have the filter to do it, I, I'm a big advocate in doing it. I'm a big advocate in being decisive about your creativity. Are you inspired to add a grad or not? If you're not, don't do it. But if you feel like the sky could be more dark and brooding, if you put a gray grad on a uh, filter on the lens at the time, you're there, the crew's there, the camera's there, you've already spent the money on rentals and salaries for everyone to be present. The director's there, the actor's giving you awesome performances. All you need to do is drop a filter, drop the filter. It's a lot easier to do it or shoot one without and shoot one with the filter. If you want to change your mind later, you got a clip with it and a clip without it. And that's still cheaper than doing it in post later. So I'm a big advocate in doing this stuff in camera. Um, the other types of filters. So we had color correction. We have polarization. We have close-up filters. Close-up filters are cool. They're like adding a magnifying glass to your image, right? It's pretty cool. If you have a lens like the Rokinon 50 millimeter, the minimum focusing distance is 24 inches over 22 inches, I think. If you want to photograph a ring or a watch face or a bug, right? And you want that detail to be big in frame, you can't do that with the 50 millimeter lens unless you have either a macro lens, which is a different kind of 50 millimeter lens and a more expensive rental or purchase or you can put a $20 close-up filter on that 50 millimeter lens. And depending on which grade you put on, you can start minim You can start reducing your minimum focusing distance. This happens to be, uh, it's called a plus two close-up filter, right? Or plus two diopter in 77 mil, right? I could put that on my cinema lens. So this 11 to 16, the minimum focus is 
1.2 feet. Okay, 1.2 feet. But if I put this plus two on there, all of a sudden, my minimum focusing distance becomes like eight inches. So I can get five inches closer. And that might be a, a considerable compositional advantage. Okay, that extra closeness, right? If I stack them, I could get even closer. They come in sets of four usually, plus one, plus two, plus three, and plus four. And you can stack them in any combination to get up to plus, what is that, plus uh, 10, right? So if you have a lens whose minimum focusing distance is five feet, like a 100 or 135 millimeter lens, and you want to get really up close to shoot an eyeball, let's say, put all, you know, stack all your close-up filters on there until you can get the size of the eyeball the way you want it in frame. Close-up filters, really great accessory to have. I got a set of four Vivitars. I think I paid like $30 for it at Amazon for 77 millimeter. It's, you know, for that little bit of money, it's, it's, um, I'd rather have them in my, lens box or my filter box, uh, if I don't need them, it's no big deal. But if you need a close-up filter and you don't have it, uh, no amount of money is gonna get it there in the moment that you need it exactly when you need it, okay? It's gonna be, you know, you're gonna pay a premium for that from the rental house, let's say. You gotta call and wake somebody up to go to the rental house, get the filter, bring it to you on set at two o'clock in the morning. And suddenly that $25 filter rental is now a $400 filter rental because you paid night premium. You got a guy out of bed on a Saturday when he would normally be closed to bring you something personally and hand it to you while you're shooting. Rental houses don't like to do that without charging you a pile of money. So I'd rather spend $30 and have the set in my, in my, in my filter box. My filter box is over on my camera cart with my lens box and my accessories and everything else. If I need it, it's there. If I don't need it, no big deal. It wasn't that expensive. Neutral density filters, I talked to you about those. Neutral density filters are like sunglasses for your lens. So if you're shooting outside and the scene is too bright and you've done every adjustment you can do to your camera and the image is still too bright on the monitor, it might be time to start stacking neutral density filters on the lens to make the image darker. ND filters are worth their weight in gold. And I'm gonna to talk to you about them again next week in terms of uh, being a, an exposure solution. They're a really easy exposure solution that will alleviate a lot of exposure calculation that most of you guys don't like to do. And I don't like to really do either at the end of the day, not anymore. Um, talk to you about polarizers and how they reduce reflections. You have to turn a polarizer though. Did you ever use a pair of polarizing sunglasses and you turn them when you're outside to see the sky get dark blue or light blue, depending on how you angle the glasses? Well, the polarizer for the cinema camera works the same way. You just turn the polarizer in the lens holder or in the filter holder or in the map box until you get the correct angle on the filter. And then you'll see reflections in glass or water uh, go away depending on what angle you've turned the filter stage in your map box. Okay. Uh, polarizers also will make your sky darker in color. Any color really will look more saturated under a polarizer. But polarizers, practically speaking, are best used outside with lots of light because they act like a neutral density 2x, which is like, or a 4x, I'm sorry, which is uh, they subtract a great deal of light from what passes through the lens and your exposures will be a lot darker with a polarizer inside. So generally we only use them outside. Um, and I already talked to you about the grad filter. You know what that does. So that's, that's basically it. That is all seven weeks of cinematography one up to this point. Um, and if it wasn't discussed here, it won't be on the test. Um, one of the things that <laughs> the first question I got from my Monday class was, are we going to have to be able to calculate the size of the data card? And I said, no, you won't have to do that. I wouldn't be that cruel. Um, and the other question was, do we have to calculate T stops and F stops? And I said, no, you won't have to do that either. I just want you to know how that stuff is done. And I want you to know that there is a way and there is a formula and there is a you know, if you're hip to the math and you don't mind doing it, yeah, you can calculate those things and it's not that hard to do.
But mo most of the time that work has been done for us either by the manufacturer or by the camera itself. A lot of these cameras make compensating efforts automatically in their uh, processors in their in their exposure evaluation systems and, and we don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. It's more like what we had to deal with in the film era and that era is past. So um, you have now the remainder of the week to access the quiz and take it between now and Saturday. Okay. So your homework assignment is to study, study, study. And you will have 60 no, 90 minutes to do 30 questions, 30 multiple choice questions, okay? So I think that's fair. That's three minutes per question. Um, not quite enough time to look up every answer. So if, if that's your plan, I wouldn't uh, pursue that, uh, that mode because you won't finish the, the quiz. But, you know, you can do most of the questions. If you have to look up one or two, you know, you'll have a little extra time, but um, I suggest studying uh, so that the, the information and the knowledge becomes yours and it doesn't become something that you constantly have to look up. If you're constantly looking things up, here's what I'm gonna, here's a little piece of advice I'm gonna give you guys. I didn't tell my other class. This is a very powerful tool, okay? We have Google on this thing. I've got e GPS on this thing. I can do all kinds of cool stuff with this. I could be a moron with a really good phone and Google and I could get a lot accomplished, okay? But the folks that you're gonna be working for out in the field are not paying you to look things up. They're paying you to know how to do things so that you can do them immediately when it's required. Most producers are very impatient. They either wanted it yesterday or they want it all today, they want, two days worth of work in one day in a one day package. Okay. And what they don't want are people that have to look up all the answers to the questions that they should know the answers to already. That's why they're hiring you and paying you a good rate to work on their movie, because presumably you already know this information inside and out and you are a master of the concepts already. If you got to look everything up and they're paying you a professional union rate to do it, they might as well hire an idiot with no union affiliation who doesn't know anything that can look it all up and save on the rate. And that's exactly how they think about this. Okay. They don't want to pay you for information that you don't possess that you've got to look up well, they're trying to make their movie. That's all supposed to be done and dusted. So you can take these quizzes and look it all up and just temporarily memorize it or you can own the knowledge and you can use it when you get out into the field and use it effectively, okay? That's what the pros do. So either way, whatever you wanna do, I recommend a little bit of study, a little bit of memorization, and then practice is gonna make perfect, okay? Um, I think you still got a little time left on the due date of your shooting assignment. Uh, there'll be another shooting assignment before the end of the semester. And pretty much most of your classes after this are going to have uh, shooting as a component of your learning experience. So uh, you're going to have opportunities to expedite all of this knowledge and perfect your skills and everything moving forward. Um, that's what we call becoming a professional, folks. Learn it, memorize it, and make it your own. I wish you good luck. Um, you shouldn't need it though. Um, I think I made the quiz about as easy as I could possibly make it. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a big advocate for trick questions. I don't like to be clever in a test and, and word it in such a way that it could be one thing or the other. And it's really not, you're not sure. I'm asking some pretty straightforward questions based on what we've talked about. And you've either been present for the experience or not. And if you haven't been, and I happen to know, folks, that there are some people out there that are telling me they've watched none of you guys because you're obviously here. But there's some folks out there that are not watching these lecture videos, but they're saying they did in the in the assignment. And I'm giving them credit for it because I'm taking them on their word. Um, but the proof's going to come out when they take the quiz and they haven't looked at the videos and they don't really know the information. And then they're going to try and look it all up and they're not going to be able to finish on time. <laughs> So don't be that person. 
Um, I want to open it up for questions. Um, and if there aren't any, then we can adjourn. So does anybody have uh, any thoughts, observations, or questions about what we've gone over? Anything I haven't gone over that you want to address now? Anything at all? Will the slide, it, are the slides on Canvas or will they be on Canvas? Um, I thought I put them up there for you already. Let's have a look. I'm going to start. Are. are they there? It really? should yeah, be, they're there. It should be a PDF of the file of the same name that the that the lecture is. So I think okay. it, it'll say okay. like it'll say deck eight, deck S8 review, and it'll be a PDF. So the only difference is when I make a PDF of these cells out of Keynote, um, the backgrounds aren't black, they're gray. I don't know why. I don't know what the problem is, but um, so the text, like a text on this page, it'll be white text or yellow text against a gray background, not a dark black background. Okay, so, you know, you'll have to maybe magnify the pages a little bit to, to see the, the text clearly, but the images all translate just fine. So you shouldn't have any problem. If it's an illustration like that or like this, you should have no problem interpreting those slides from a PDF. Okay. Where, um, yeah. Where would you find the 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 PowerPoint slides? Uh, I put the lecture up on web courses, so you are here now for the live session. But you could go back and watch this again, pre-recorded, on web courses. It'll be up in forty-five minutes. If you just want to read it, I just want to read it. Well, here's what you can do, right? I don't know if you know this trick already. Go to the lecture on YouTube and go in, the, go in the upper right corner of the window and select oh, playback yeah. speed and select 1.5X or 2X, or I think it's 1.5 or 175 playback speed. And then scan through the video until you get to the part you want to look at and then hit play, you know, regular, regular play and watch it back in real time. You don't have to watch this the whole video in real time. You can watch it at one and a half speed and be done in 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. Or just to open up, you know, open up YouTube and scrub through the video until you see the slide you want to read and then, you know, pause the video and read the slide. The, the, I would put the keynotes up there, but this, the, the file sizes are enormous. And most of the time it crashes web courses. It's just too much data for web courses to upload. So that's why I don't do it. That's why the yeah. videos are on YouTube because they're, it's even harder to embed the videos on, on web courses. It's harder than if I just give you a link to my YouTube page where the videos are on YouTube. YouTube's compression uh, algorithm and their upload uh, bandwidth is much broader than web courses. It's a monster. So I can put up, I can upload a, a file that's 1.2 gigs in a matter of, you know, 20 or 30 minutes. It would take forever, if at all, on web courses. Most of the time it just crashes web courses. So I don't, I don't try to do that anymore. I use the YouTube method instead. So, um, but your PDF is there, the YouTube file is there, the link to the um, lecture is in web courses. Um, you know, and if you have a question that you can't find, just shoot me an email and I'll answer you uh, as quickly as I can, provided you're not sitting there with the test open. <laughs> um, so anybody else, any, anything at all that uh, we can cover now before it's too late? Yeah, one question about do we still do we have are there going to be any questions on film splicing because that's something I feel like it's going to be have to be done in my in in my um project. Film splicing. Like taking two pieces of footage that were recorded or 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 filmed at two separate occasions and put in, and then fusing them together, whether it be digital or on on a filament. That's called editing, son. That's a different class. Oh, it's editing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was part of cinematography as well, you know. No, I'm not addressing that here. We shoot clips, scenes, takes, we call them, right? Okay. And then the editors and the post-production video visual effects people will do things like blend frames and put in transitions or 
splice a lot of times what the editors will do we might have a really good take of an actress delivering a really important line of dialogue but she flubs the last line but she did the first three lines really great and then on a different take she flubs the first two lines and gives us the last two lines really really great and the editors will go in and they'll cut the front off of one take and the back off the other and marry them together uh, and we get one perfect take that was manufactured from the original footage which was flawed in some way um, and that is something that we know happens as cinematographers uh, but that's handled by post-production and the editors okay i just thought that was part of the cinema i thought editing was also fused in with cinematography at some point to a degree it, it is in the sense that it's good for you to know how a film is going to be cut together when you're shooting it in the first place so you know what things to shoot um if i'm doing uh like at my production company i used to shoot a lot of um like commercials and stuff and uh, I would hire an editor to cut the commercial because I'm not an editor, I'm a cinematographer. So I'd hire an editor. But what I would do is if there was a lot of complex shooting or if there was element shooting with green screens or process shots and stuff, I would have the editor come in, pay the day rate and the editor would be on set with me. And I would ask the editor questions about my setups to make sure that I was shooting the right thing so that it would cut well in post-production when the time came. And so from a certain point of view, the cinematographer is shooting with the edit in mind. Absolutely. But we don't deal with it beyond providing the footage in its raw state. And then the editors cut it up. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Anybody else? Anything at all? It's not quite an hour and a half yet. So we've actually, well, actually no, it's been two and a half hours. It's time to, it's time to whip this puppy into shape and get on to something else. I would do use a different euphemism, but I'd probably get in trouble. So Andrew, you want to call it a night? No more questions? Andrew, I like your Tron legacy poster in the background there. You actually saw that? A lot of people saw that. I think it's a very underrated film, actually. <laughs> yeah. Nice use of like CGI it. and digital cinematography. Followed by a very underrated prequel series. I don't know about that, but yeah. Tron Uprising? I'll check it out. I'll check it out. It only has one season, but it takes place in between the events of the first film and the second. I haven't. Th oh, yes, I have thought. I've seen the first film. I'll, ch I'll check it out, yeah. Yeah, it should be on, I think it might be on Disney Plus because Disney owns Tron. Yeah, I remember I remember that first uh the beginning before they go into the Tron world. That felt like a like a David Fincher film. That was really well done. Is that the film with the uh Daft Punk? Sound? Yeah, the Daft Punk R.I.P. Daft Punk. Yeah. Yeah, that good soundtrack, man. Yeah. Derez, that's a good ass track. I, I will say to, that uh, they that Disney's best movie was actually an animated, one of their best movies are animated features because really that's what their specialty is to me. Yeah. Yeah, well, they started doing the animated features. Snow White, right? That's what yeah. I think, I think I used to go to Vegas a lot and I would listen to the soundtrack of Tron Legacy when I was driving through the desert. That's so cool. It's about a four hour drive from LA to Las Vegas. And uh, about two and a half hours of that drive is through the Mojave. So yeah. that was the perfect desert driving music, especially at night. So that one, the drive soundtrack from Drive 2011. That's another <laughs> great one. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, what's his name? That's um, Kaminsky. He's uh, actually uh, the child of the 80s. I think he did the soundtrack for, um, gosh, what was that film? Um, Strange Days, which was, uh, I worked with that DP a few years back. Um, Ray Fiennes in the future uh, apocalypse. Oh, the Catherine Bigelow film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I haven't yeah. checked. I haven't seen it, but I. It's really <laughs> I good. I think he did the soundtrack for that film as well. I think. But yeah. anyway, awesome. that's know. way that's way off topic. That's that's soundtracking now. That's not my area of expertise. 
So if there's no more cinematography issues or questions, then I move we adjourn the meeting. Got a favorite soundtrack guy. I like Philip Glass. I'm a big Philip Glass fan. Oh, yeah. He's done a lot of my favorite stuff. Sure. I'm Brian, him too. All right, folks. I'm going to call it. Yeah. Uh, have a good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your attention. Uh, good luck on the test. And I'll see you all next week for exposure. Take care. Um, Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.